What's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into my YouTube channel. Hey, we're going to do something really cool today. We're going to go back in history, and we're going to read one of the most interesting correspondences between two of the most significant historical figures related to the First Great Awakening in 1740 here in the United States of America, formerly known as the Colonies. Now, Sometimes I'm boggled of the mind to think about the fact that some of these great persons in history were actually friends. They corresponded, they knew each other. Imagine uh, a time and a place where such great people all lived on the planet at the same time, like Le the Wesleys, uh, like Jonathan Edwards, and like George Whitfield. Some of these guys knew each other and had correspondence with one another. Of course, George Whitfield famously was friends with the Wesley brothers, John and Charles, but he was also a correspondent with and a dear friend of Jonathan Edwards. And if you are new to this channel, uh, you, well, maybe you already know this. I'm a bit of an Edwards fanatic over here. I uh, did my doctoral dissertation related to Jonathan Edwards and his theology of joy, which by the way, uh, you could acquire if I had a copy of it handy, I might show it off here, but apparently can't find it. Uh, anyways, that's another story. But I, I think it's really cool to look at the correspondence between Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. In fact, in the colonial days, when people would write letters to one another, they would very often uh, make two copies of that letter. One they would send out and the other they would keep for themselves. And so that's how we end up accumulating this kind of historical information related to these great correspondences. So what I'd like to do in this video is to look at Jonathan Edwards's letter to the great George Whitfield, the great revivalist and evangelist from 1740. We're going to read it together, and then uh, we're going to make some comments as we go. But if you do happen to be new or visiting, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed church just north of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. If you're anywhere near Butler, Cranberry, Historic Saxonburg, or Pittsburgh, come visit us on the Lord's Day. We have services at 8, 30, 11, and 4 o'clock p.m. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little uh, screen sharing technology right here. And uh, there I am in the corner of the screen. And I've got us all set up here on edwards.yale.edu, which if you are new to Jonathan Edwards studies, this is the website where you can get practically everything that Jonathan Edwards ever wrote. In fact, uh, here it is right here. Let's have a look at the website. And we're very thankful to our friends at Yale for posting this kind of content. So look through here over with me on the left side of your screen. Freedom of the Will, Religious Affections, Original Sin, The Great Awakening. Notice the volumes numbered one, two, three, four, and so on it goes. These are the accumulated official Yale edition works of Jonathan Edwards. What's really cool about them is they're cued to the page numbers if you're going to have the volumes printed hardback in front of you on the table so you can compare. But for those of us who do a lot of work in Jonathan Edwards studies, of course, this, uh, this particular site is absolutely critical to our continued work in Jonathan Edwards study. So what we're going to do, uh, if you'll bear with me, we're going to scroll down and we're going to go to volume 16 right here. This is the volume on letters and personal writings. And so let's go ahead and open this up. And just like an ordinary book here, you're going to see a table of contents, uh, abbreviations, note to the reader, introduction, etc. You can read all of that. You can click on any one of those items. But then uh, volume 16 is a really cool volume because it's got some really amazing content. Let's just scroll through it here for just a moment. Scroll all the way to the bottom. And uh, let's see, down, down, down. Notice this, volume 16 has the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. I've got a book coming out on the resolutions this fall, which is why I wanted to mention that. Also his diary, his very famous apostrophe to Sarah Pierpont while they were uh, well, what should we say? They weren't quite married yet, were they? No, he fell in love with this beautiful girl while they were still young, and he wrote this sort of love poem to her while they were youngins, and then also his personal narrative is also included in this volume. But what we're interested in today is letter number 23, because here we have Edwards's letter to the Reverend George Whitfield, which when we click on it, 
Um, here we go. Look at this. So this starts on page 79. You notice the page numbers here. Everything above this is page 79. Below it is page 80 if you want to follow along in the hardback. But uh, we have an editorial note here, and let's go ahead and read that. This will help us to set the scene for what it is that we're reading. It says, George Whitfield was one of the most compelling preachers in the history of Christianity. Over a span of 32 years, beginning in 1738, his oratorical skills and fervent spirit rekindled the fires of revival from Georgia to Maine. Wherever he went, he drew congregations by the hundreds and the thousands. Wholesale conversions followed, lives were transformed, and a lasting impact was made on the character of the American people. In this letter, Edwards, the father of the Great Awakening, invites its most eloquent spokesman to Northampton, the place where it all began. And I think that succinctly introduces the two protagonists in this particular letter. We have George Whitfield, who is undoubtedly the most famous preacher in the Great Awakening. But as far as the father of the Great Awakening, I don't think we could do better than to label that as Jonathan Edwards himself. After all, if Whitfield is the most famous preacher, Edwards is certainly the most renowned theologian of that era, especially as Edwards's works continue to assess the revival, even as they're unfolding somewhat in real time. As, and as much as the printing press is able to keep up with the events that are transpiring, following Jonathan Edwards' writings about the Great Awakening is going to keep you abreast of what was happening then. And from our perspective now, looking back on the events, uh, we see his A Faithful Narrative, which chronicled the local regional revival in and around Northampton in 1735. But then some of his other works, which continue to assess the Great Awakening, such as Some Thoughts on the, uh, the Awakening, one of his books, um, Religious Affections, and others, Distinguishing Marks, quite a few other works that assess the Great Awakening. So um, in February 12th of 1739-40, that's kind of an interesting way to date it, isn't it? Edwards... I'm going to take that as 1740. Edwards writes a letter to George Whitfield. Now, as far as I understand it, they had not met one another heretofore, although they'd probably heard of each other by way of reputation. In fact, we're sure that Edwards has heard of Whitfield. Obviously, why would he write him a letter? Um, and he's going to say that he knows of him and his reputation here in the letter. So let's open it up and let's read the first paragraph. He says, my request to you is that in your intended journey through New England next summer, you would be pleased to visit Northampton. I hope it is not wholly from curiosity that I desire to see and hear you in this place, but I apprehend from what I have heard that you are one that has the blessing of heaven attending you wherever you go. And I have a great desire, if it be the will of God, that such a blessing as attends your person and labors may descend on this town and may enter mine own house that I may receive it in my soul. So Edwards admits here from the very first paragraph that he's a little bit curious to hear for himself, this great preacher. Now, undoubtedly, his reputation precedes him. And even persons such as Benjamin Franklin, who is not an evangelical believer by any stretch of definition, was captivated by Whitfield's ability, his rhetoric and his oratory. Uh, one of the things that Whitfield, of course, is remarkable for is his booming voice, which, when positioned correctly on the right place on the hills and the valleys, could actually uh, spread out to thousands of people. Now, I know this is true and possible because here in western Pennsylvania, I actually live on a hill. And down below me on the other side of the street, there's a little bit of a valley and there's a restaurant across the way. And we can hear every word from people in the parking lot, I probably shouldn't tell them this, <laughs> but we can hear their conversations just as plain as a bell all the way across the way, up the hill and sitting on our front porch. So acoustics were amazing and Whitfield had this also rich, incredible voice and he preached in such a way that captivated his audiences that even Edwards, the great theologian, had to admit that he was more than curious to hear him preach. And in the opening paragraph, Edwards invites him not only to Northampton that he would come that way, but that also he would stay and reside in his own house, which we know from later history is exactly what George Whitfield did. Let's go ahead and read another paragraph. Indeed, I am fearful whether you will not be disappointed in New England and will have less success here than in other places. We who have dwelt in a land that has been distinguished with light 
have long enjoyed the gospel and have been glutted with it and have despised it, and I fear are more hardened than most other places where you have preached hitherto. But yet I hope in that power and mercy of God that it has appeared so triumphant in the success of your labors in other places that he will send a blessing with you even to us, though we are unworthy of it. I hope if God preserves my life to see something of that salvation of God in New England, which has now begun in a benighted, wicked, and a miserable world and age in which most, in which the most guilty of all nations. Now, you may think it's strange that Edwards sets the bar of expectation low for Northampton, and that's only because Edwards knows his own congregation fairly well. In fact, he admits in that paragraph that Northampton has more than its fair share of opportunities for revival. In fact, they experienced revival in that 1735 predecessor revival to the Great Awakening of 1740 to 42. And Edwards is undoubtedly here also referring not only to his own ministry and how the revival has already burned once through Northampton, but he's probably also making reference here to his great grandfather, Solomon Stoddard, who was one of the great renowned preachers of the previous age. They had had Stoddard for several decades worth of preaching ministry. And even under Stoddard's care, the Northampton Church had experienced a number of local or regional revivals. And so Edwards is hoping here, he's trying to set the bar low for Whitfield, but he basically doesn't want Whitfield to be disappointed if he doesn't yield the same kind of results that Whitfield is reported to have yielded in previous places. Let's go on. It has been with refreshment of soul that I've heard of one raised up in the Church of England to revise the, mysteri the mysteries, mysterious spiritual despised and exploded doctrines of the gospel, and full of a spirit of zeal for the promotion of real and vital piety, whose labors have been attended with such great success. Blessed be the God that hath done it, who is with you and helps you and makes the weapons of your warfare mighty. We see that God is faithful and never will forget the promises that he has made to his church and that he will not suffer the smoking flax to be quenched. There he quotes Isaiah, even when the floods seem to be overwhelming it, but will revive the flame again, even in the darkest times. I hope this is the dawning of a day of God's mighty power and glorious grace to the world of mankind. May you go on, reverend sir, and may God be with you more and more abundantly that the work of God may be carried on by a blessing of your labor still with that swift progress that it has been here to, hitherto and rise to a greater height and extend further and further with an irre, irresistible power bearing down all opposition. Now, this is kind of interesting that Edwards mentions the Church of England. You can see that I have that highlighted here <laughs> because most of the Puritans um, and especially the colonial Puritans were not big fans of their Anglican colleagues. In fact, uh, many of the Puritans viewed the Church of England as rather staid and somewhat spiritually dead. In fact, there was no little controversy when the rector of uh, Yale, Timothy Cutler, defected to the Church of England. It was a great scandal in those earlier days of Yale. And uh, Edwards is saying, look, um, I know you're a Church of England guy, but what can I say? Uh, your results speak for themselves. Clearly, you're preaching has the attendance of that divine help of the Holy Spirit. And so he says, may you go on, Reverend Sir. In other words, uh, God bless you, be with you, continue to do what you're doing for the harvest is great and your work is wonderful. He says, and may the gates of hell never be able to prevail against you and may God send forth more labors into his harvest of a like spirit until the kingdom of Satan shall shake and his proud empire fall throughout the earth, and the kingdom of Christ, that glorious kingdom of light, holiness, peace, and love, shall be established from one end of the earth to the other. Gotta love this prayer. Edwards is praying that Habakkuk 2.14 would be true. Of course, the prophet says that the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, and Edwards is, of course, referring here to the statement of Jesus that we ought to pray that his labors would be sent into the harvest field for the work is great, but the labors are few. And clearly, Edwards, a great advocate of the revivals, is uh, he can only pray that Whitfield would be as successful in Northampton as he has been in previous places. 
He mentions here a familiar colleague. He says, give my love to Mr. William Seward. I hope to see him here with you. I believe I may venture to say that what has been heard of your labors and success has been taken notice of more in any place in New England than here or received with fuller credit. I hope therefore, if we have opportunity, we shall hear you with greater attention. The way from New York to Boston through Northampton is but little further than the nearest that is. And I think leads through as populous a part of the country as any. Now here Edwards is making a geographical appeal to try to uh, convince Whitfield to come because at this point it wasn't sure that he would. But if you were going from New York to Boston, and if you trace the closest route as the crow flies, Edward says you barely have to go out of your way to reach our village here in Northampton. And by, by the way, uh, that might be the most populous route. And of course, that would be a compelling argument to Whitfield, Whitfield whose whole goal is to preach the gospel, whether he's going to do it near the coal mines, the fields, the churches, the pastures, or the the mild hills, whatever, doesn't matter. Edward says, look at a map, we're on the way, all right? Um, he says, I desire that you and Mr. Seward would come directly into my house. I shall account it a great favor and smile of providence to have opportunity to entertain such guests under my roof and to have some acquaintance with such persons. In fact, that's exactly what happened. And Whitfield, curiously enough, was so enchanted with the Edwards home when he did come that he decided that he might like to get married too, because at this point, Whitfield, would, Whitfield was not yet married, and he saw the delightful marriage between Jonathan and Sarah and their quaint and charming home with their children. He was much blessed by staying under the roof of Edwards and longed for a wife from that point on. And the letter finishes up here. I fear that it is too much for me to desire a particular remembrance in your prayers when I consider how many thousands no doubtless desire it, who can't all be particularly mentioned. And I am far from thinking myself worthy to be distinguished. But pray, sir, let your heart be lifted up to God for me among others, that God would bestow much of that blessed spirit on me that he has bestowed on you and to make me also an instrument of his glory. I am, Reverend Sir, unworthy to be called your fellow laborer, Jonathan Edwards. And so here in the closing paragraph, Edwards pleads with Whitfield to remember him in his prayers, although he admits uh, quite humbly and meekly, I might add, that Whitfield's prayer list is probably so long that he wouldn't even think to mention a person as unworthy as Jonathan Edwards. Uh, but he does nevertheless ask that Whitfield would remember, if not him, men like him who are the local church pastors of that time. Now, one final note here is I do love the closings of Jonathan Edwards' letters, and you can notice that as you work through volume 16, how sweet and endearing the closing of his letters are, especially when he writes to his wife, when one or both of them is on a journey, or his precious daughters or his children. Uh, very often, he'll say something very tender and sweet in his sign-off, and then he signs his name, of course, uh, Jonathan Edwards at the end. Well, I hope you found that reading through that great letter from colonial history was a benefit to your soul. I know it is certainly a benefit of mine. One of the things that I will take away from this letter is this paragraph right here where Edwards mentions how vital it is that we have gospel preaching ministers in the churches and how he prays that our preaching would be, as he says here, with the weapons of a mighty warfare. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, definitely appreciate you checking in here. Love you lots, and we will talk to you later.